Kaczynski, who's uh, an amateur astronomer and a professional spacecraft engineer from uh, Johns Hopkins University APL, uh, who's worked on many mes uh, missions. Messenger is not his most recent one, I think, huh. but since we had a talk tomorrow afternoon from Harold Geller, um, we asked him to reveal his, his messenger job. Uh, he's also an avid astrophotographer, and we were hoping that he'd also be able to give a talk on uh, uh, time lapse astrophotography, but he said if people want to talk to him about that topic uh, later on, he's going to do some of that at the station now for this evening. So he is going to talk about the messenger mission this afternoon. And uh, with that, please, please welcome me. How are you guys doing today? Good? How about that out in the tent? I can't hear them, can I? No. Okay, excellent. So you're at JPL? APL. APL. Yeah. JPL. Yeah, JPL's on the other coast. I was going to say. Yeah. So, um, as, as Alan said, I, I worked on the messenger mission. I worked on it from uh, 2006 until, well, it impacted last uh, year. And I have still been in somewhat involved with some of the science uh, data analysis on a low level, but most of my time now is working on New Horizons and the Mission Operations Center. So I worked mission operations for uh, Messenger also. So uh, the talk today is just going to be about Messenger and the planet Mercury. So why would uh, we want to go to Mercury? I mean, it's just this rocky ball that's right next to the sun. There's nothing interesting about it, right? It's dull, it's lifeless, it's not exciting, doesn't have exciting gas clouds like Jupiter and Saturn, doesn't have a ring system like Saturn. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a rocky world, you know, it's, and it's tiny, it's pretty small. But it, learning more about Mercury allows us to understand more of how the solar system formed or learn what questions we didn't know what to ask before about how the solar system formed. And also, while we were doing this, we discovered that Mercury is a planet of extremes, of which I will go through in just a moment. So uh, this is a list of all the missions, uh, the number of missions that have gone to each of these different objects here. Venus has had 40-some missions. Mars has had over 50 missions. I think, actually, that's uh, now up to 52 or 53. Uh, asteroids and comets have had you know, 13, 14 missions. Mercury's now had two missions. We've had two missions go to Mercury. And the KBOs out there, Pluto Charon, we've had one mission now to get out there. So I mentioned that Mercury is the planet of extremes. It's got the most eccentric orbit, and we're going to uh, stick to the quote-unquote classical planets in this regards. Uh, it has the most inclined orbit of the classical planets, and it's the smallest of the classical planets. It has the highest temperature extremes, of all the planets, uh, over 1,200 degrees from the early mor uh, pre-dawn early morning to the mid-afternoon time frame. It has the shortest sidereal period, and it's the only planet in our solar system that has a 3-2 spin resonance as it goes around the sun and rotates on its axis. It's quite dense. It's nearly as dense as Earth. It has a magnetic dipole, which was completely unexpected if to have a... Uh, a magnetic field that's a dipole, you need to have an active core. And we had believed that Mercury was b essentially dead like the moon. It was just a dull, rocky planet. There's no active core in the center. And it also has the smallest axial tilt of all the bodies of the solar system at 0 0.01 degrees. Earth, as, as you're familiar with, has a, a tilt of 23.5 degrees. Uh, Jupiter is the second uh, least tilted one at 3.1 degrees. And this plays a strong role in the uh, stuff we discovered and learned about at the poles, which I'll cover later. So back in the 70s, mid-70s, 73, 74, uh, 75, we had Mariner 10 went out and did three flybys of Mercury. This is our first time we got to visit the planet Mercury. During those flybys, we got to see 45% of this half of the planet. Uh, that was due to the orientation of the flybys, the uh, point at which it re, uh, encountered Mercury again was always the same side, and the failing uh, systems on Mariner 10. It went out there with three television cameras. By the time it did the third flyby, it had one television camera working. The other two had died. So we, they were never able to map the entire planet's surface. 
But despite the, the uh, technology challenges they had, and despite the fact we only got three flybys out of it, we discovered all kinds of things about Mercury. First being there was a global magnetic field. Even though it's you know, one one hundredth the strength of Earth's magnetic field, it's, it's there, it exists, it's, an, it's a global event. We discovered how dense Mercury is. We discovered that there's a thin, extremely thin, blends into space atmosphere, what we call an exosphere, that's around Mercury. And we were able to measure the temperatures on Mercury's surface. So this is a, a couple images from Mariner 10. Uh, you guys have heard of the Chloris Basin. It's like the fourth largest impact basin in the solar system. And Mariner 10 saw that part of it right there. We didn't see the rest of it off onto the left. And this here is just a close up of this point right here. And you see all these wrinkle ridges in here from where this uh, lava field after the impact basin formed had solidified and bunched up. In the intervening years after that, the only way we could really study uh, Mercury is with the Arecibo telescope, doing uh, radar studies of it. So we could get radar imagery of the surface, but not visual imagery. While they were doing radar studies, because of the uh, orbital tilt of the planet, we could see the pole area. And we got these very, very bright radar returns from the poles that no one expected. And they seemed to coincide with what appeared to be crater spots. But we had no uh, visual imagery of these areas, so we had no direct confirmation that yes, that's definitely a crater versus that's just definitely something that's very bright on the surface. So APL, A as in for Applied Physics Lab, not JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's okay. <laughs> um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory does all the Mars stuff. So if you hear about Mars, it's 99% of it's JPL. Uh, APL uh, did the spacecraft that went to Mercury and uh, New Horizons that went to Pluto. So MESSENGER is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Mercury Surface Space Environment and Geochemistry and Ranging. They really had to stretch to get MESSENGER <laughs> out of this. And y you understand why they took, chose MESSENGER, right? Because Mercury is the messenger of the gods. So uh, when, they, uh, when the science team put the proposal together, they, had to, they, had these, they proposed these six questions. These are the questions we want to answer when we send this mission to Mercury. Why is it so dense? What's the nature of the magnetic field? What are the important volatiles on Mercury? What's the geologic history? What's going on here at the poles? And what's the st uh, state and structure of the core? So to accomplish these, to, to answer these questions, uh, we had to uh, hit these objectives. Image the entire surface in color, over 100,000 images. Actually, we got over a quarter million images taken of the surface of Mercury because we were able to stay longer than we had originally planned. Do a full survey of the uh, magnetic field. Search for ice on the surface or some other exospheric species that could come from polar ice deposits, assuming those bright spots are ice. And if there are ice, what kind of ice are they? Uh, doing a, a surface map of the uh, elements and the minerals all, all over the place, and this is one of the things that's actually still ongoing because uh, the, s the spectrometers have taken millions and millions of spectra. That's a lot of data to go plowing through. Uh, measuring the topography, which we did with the laser altimeter that's on board the spacecraft. Mapping the exosphere. Uh, trying to understand what is composed in the exosphere and, and where does it come from? How does it replenish itself? And to see if we see any mutation in, uh, in how Mercury um, rotates. So I want to uh, cover some of the technical accomplishments here. Uh, one of them is being is uh, we designed at APL this uh, ceramic sunshade. It's not very thick. It's uh, millimeters uh, thick. Uh, it's interleaved with uh, mylar and other ceramics. And it sits on this portion of the spacecraft. The back part you see here has no sunshade on it. So being so close to the sun, because you know, we've got this giant plasma ball here, we've got a lot of heat energy coming off the sun. So we need to be able to keep the things in the back on the, in the main uh, payload uh, relatively cool. So this sunshade, turns out, did exactly what we wanted it to do. It, the front of it was you know, hundreds and hundreds of degrees, but the back part of the spacecraft stayed a little bit 
about room temperature, 70, 80 degrees Fahrenheit for the most part. There were times when we would heat spike uh, and that would be due to the orientation of the orbit. When we passed directly in front of the bright Mercury, we get re-radiated heat off the surface and that would spike the back end. But it would be for brief enough periods of time that it would not uh, just uh, damage, irrevocably damage the uh, spacecraft. Uh, the blue squares here on either side are the solar panels. And the solar panels here, you see, and this is a spacecraft here, and these are some folks in the uh, clean room as they're putting it together, so you see how big the spacecraft is compared to uh, a person. The solar panels are two-thirds mirrors. And the reason it's two-thirds mirrors is because we don't want the solar cells to melt. So we have to reflect all the heat from that plasma ball next to us off of the solar panels. The solar panels are, all, are also articulable. So we can turn them to be completely face on or we can rotate them 95 degrees off of the sun. And for the most of the mission, while we were in orbit around Mercury, we had them rotated 70 to 80 degrees off of the sun because we were getting so much energy from the sun, we didn't need to have them full on. When we launched, after we launched from Earth, we had to turn them on full on to the sun so we had enough uh, juice to keep the spacecraft powered. Yeah. Uh, so, were the, was that expected? Were the solar panels designed to power the, the, the craft uh, through in route to Mercury, or was it that we could have sent lighter, smaller panels if we wanted to? We could have sent smaller panels, uh, because, but we sent panels this large because we expected degradation over years. Uh, and since it was taking us years to get to Mercury, uh, we launched in 2005 and we didn't get there to 2011 to go into orbit. Uh, we figured that the solar cells would degrade over time. Uh, so having a larger panel allowed us to have a buffer for degradation, which didn't happen near as bad as we had thought it might happen. We, the, we, the panels stayed much healthier than we had planned them to be. So in hindsight, we could have sent smaller panels. Uh, we also designed a, uh, a phased array antenna with which to uh, communicate uh, with the Deep Space Network. There's uh, three stations of the Deep Space Network that communicate with all the spacecraft in the solar system. There's one in uh, Madrid, Spain, there's one in Canberra, Australia, and there's one in Goldstone, California. So there's, they're spaced about 120 degrees ac across the uh, Earth's surface to do a basic global coverage of the solar system. And with the phased arrays, we were able to then, when since we have to keep this part of the spacecraft facing the sun at all times, uh, we can only rotate the spacecraft maybe 10 degrees off of the, the sun spacecraft line before the sun starts to impact the back part of the spacecraft. So if we had an antenna, a directional antenna, with, uh, if you think about New Horizons, it has a dish on there, you have to actually turn the whole spacecraft to point that dish to Earth to communicate with it. With the phased array antennae, we didn't have to necessarily do that. So we have one in the back that would pick Earth up out there, and then we have one in the front when Mercury is on the far side of the sun from us, we could still communicate with the spacecraft. And Messenger had a host of instrumentation on it. Um, and many of these uh, instruments were actually more than one detector. So the, uh, uh, the mask instrument here, this is the one that I uh, worked with primarily, is actually two detectors. There's a visual and infrared uh, spectrometer, and there's an ultraviolet and visible spectrometer. And of all the instruments on here, it was the most self-conflicted instrument because the team that operated the UVVS, the ultraviolet and visible spectrometer, wanted to study the exosphere. The team that operated the VIS, uh, the VIRS uh, spectrometer, wanted to study the surface. They both pointed in the same direction. There's no gimbals on this thing, so we had to actually turn the whole spacecraft either off the planet to look at the exosphere or on the planet to not look at the exosphere. So you can imagine maybe there's some, some discussion about, well, I want some time to look at the exosphere by one team, and no, we want some time to look at the surface by other teams. But uh, even though we had these, these conflicts of, of scheduling, uh, of all the missions I've been on, the, the teams on Messenger worked and played the best I've ever seen of any, of any science teams. Was, uh, was fuel an issue because of all the steering you had to do? Uh, it was, but it turned out not to be as much. Now, I'll actually cover that a little bit here in just a, a slide or two. Um, getting to orbit. Getting to Mercury is hard. 
It's actually harder to get to Mercury, which is a lot closer to us than Jupiter, than it is to get out to Jupiter. That's because getting to Jupiter, once you, you've got your escape velocity speed going, you get out there and you're fine. Getting to Mercury, you have to keep slowing down because you're falling down the gravity wall of the sun and it's pulling you in and you're gonna go faster. If you were to go straight to Mercury, you could not carry enough fuel to slow down by the time you got there. You'd be sucked down by the gravity wall so fast, you would just shoot right past it. So what we had to do was play this movie. Where's my mur cursor? I don't remember. So um, this is just a ghost. We're going to launch here. We're going to you're going to see uh, the orbit of Mercury or of Messenger as it spins around and as it spirals in to get to Mercury here. And this covers over a period of um, seven years. And we went around the sun 15 times. Oh, come on. There's no sound with it, so you have to supply your own soundtrack. <laughs> you guys think you're funny. So the DSM is a deep space maneuver, which we had five deep space maneuvers in the plan of uh, this whole cruise phase to get to Mercury. And that's where we fire the main engine to slow the spacecraft down and to change the trajectory. We also had uh, 30 or 40 uh, smaller maneuvers called trajectory correction maneuvers, TCMs, built into the plan that we would uh, sprinkle through here to help just adjust things accordingly. And we're there. But the TCMs, we didn't f do all of them. We did 20 or 22, I think, total. Uh, I don't remember now. It's been, been a while. But one of the uh, spacecraft engineers came up with this brilliant idea of using the solar panels as solar sails. And, and so we sat down. Well, th the engineering team that came up with this idea, sat down, they looked at the math, they said, you know, if we just do this for so long, as long as you're doing this, over the period of time, you adjust very slowly versus trying to fire the engine for a short period of time, like 20 minutes or so. If you do this over months, you will get that same effect. You just have to do it much earlier. And we, we demonstrated we could do it. We did it for the rest of the cruise phase before we got into orbit. And the uh, gentleman who came up with the idea won the Robert H. Heinlein Award for coming up with this idea. I'm just wondering, with all those Venus flybys, did you actually improve the methods of the mass of Venus? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we did a little bit of science on Venus, but not a lot. I don't know if the what mass... The uh, dynamics of, you used, because you used Venus to slow down. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you could see the effect of Venus and gravity on your orbit. Right. I don't know uh, what, their what their findings were on that. Uh, so March 18th of 2011, um, we entered orbit. This is a uh, graph plot. While we were going to orbit, we couldn't um, operate the phase arrays to communicate with Earth. We, the spacecraft had to do its thing. So what we could get was a, a low uh, signal from the spacecraft, a low beam signal that just basically said, I'm here. And we could follow that I'm here signal. And this was the, the green line is the predicted plot that we would see the Doppler shift of that signal as we went into orbit. And the red line is the uh, results that we got from uh, the signal as it was going in. And you can see it, it was nailed straight on and it finished out perfect. Uh, the orbital insertion was perfect. Uh, the nav team described it they were the ones who, who put this whole navigation thing together from the beginning as if you were to shoot an arrow from DC to Los Angeles, hit the eye of a statue, fire a second arrow, and split it. And that's how close we were to what we wanted to get to. So some of the, the highlights of, uh, from the science. Uh, some trivia here. Oh, um, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you guys, there's going to be a test at the end of this. I'm serious, I've, I've got some giveaways here. And so I'll be asking you guys questions. And if you, win, if you answer it, then you can win a poster. And, and there's a little, the poster is, um, 
a montage of uh, the team members who were involved in this. There's one of me here. <laughs> so um, anyway, some of the uh, findings. Uh, we found this really dark material on Mercury. We call it low reflectance material, material or LRM. We found over a dozen volcanic uh, caldera. We uh, discovered that, okay, we re-examined to confirm that Mercury has a global magnetic field, but it's not exactly co-aligned with the planet. It's actually offset by about 400 kilometers to the north. And did this gift play when I first brought it up? So, <laughs> so that's the magnetic equator right there, and that's the rotational equator down here. Sure, you get a poster. <laughs> that's one less I have to come up. I have a question I have to come up with. Um, we have the fourth or seventh largest impact basins on the planet. Uh, the Colaris, Colaris Basin is the fourth largest. Uh, we discovered this feature that we have since uh, come up with the term as hollows. Prior to this, we had no, we'd never seen anything like this before. Uh, our, we had over 4,100 orbits what before. The hollows? The hollows are a geographic, a geologic feature on the planet. Uh, I, I have a whole section on, on craters. sort of, but they're not craters. But they're associated with craters, mostly but not always. <laughs> I know it doesn't quite answer the question, but I have a whole section on hollows here coming up. Uh, like I said, we took over a quarter million images of the surface, and we discovered, well, didn't discover, we confirmed that the bright spots at the poles is actually water ice. So uh, Mariner 10, Mariner 10, as I mentioned, uh, did three flybys of Mercury and saw 45% of the surface of the planet. So our first flyby filled in this area here. We got higher resolution sections here and we got to see some of the back part. The Caloris Basin is this little spot right here. We got to see the entire Caloris Basin from the first flyby. And the science team was so excited by just this, they declared the, the, the mission of victory. That if we did, got nothing else, they, they were happy. The second flyby, we got this whole section here. The third flyby, we pretty much uh, finished up getting the initial uh, views of the equatorial regions and s uh, some chunk of the polar areas. And uh, so this is after the, uh, the flybys. We still didn't get everything here, but when we went to orbit, we were going in a polar orbit. So we were able to do a full global map of the planet. So, um, some of the things that we were looking at, uh, the orientation of the orbit was inertially fixed to a plane. So um, satellites that orbit the Earth precess, so they will move. So if you go out tonight, if the ISS were going overhead in one spot, you could go out tomorrow night, it would not be there because it, the, the orbit had precessed away. On Mercury, if you're sitting there and messenger went overhead, you could wait if, uh, eight hours and it will go right back overhead again a, f a few degrees over because the planet has rotated in that time. So Mercury, uh, Messenger's orbit was fixed relative to Mercury and we let the planet or, uh, rotate underneath us. Uh, that gave us different phase angles that we could see uh, from the sun illuminating the surface of Mercury. When we had a, a high phase angle, we would get, when the sun's low to the horizon, we would get to see the topography here, all the shadows, and you can see all these craters. When the sun was high overhead, we had a low phase angle, we would, those, a lot of these craters would vanish, we wouldn't see them anymore. But you could see these uh, ejecta rays, you could see this dark material that you can't see in this image here. So taking these two uh, views and putting them together is, is one of the key elements that we had to understand what the surface of Mercury was like. One of the other things we wanted to see was the cratering on Mercury. The northern uh, half of the planet is, is fairly sparse in craters. It's got a lot of large, just smooth plains areas. The southern half of Mercury, on the other hand, is just completely shotgunned with crater holes all over the place. 
So this tells us that at some time in the past, which we figure is the, uh, during what was known as the, the late heavy bombardment period, uh, there was a bunch of material that came streaming through the solar system and just blasted the southern hemispheres of the planets. And because there's no real weathering on Mercury, a lot of this stuff has been preserved over the uh, millennia. Crater counting is very important on Mercury to try and understand ages of things. We don't have uh, anything that we can say, well, this happened in the year uh, 22,000 BC, and this happened in the year uh, 267,000 BC, or anything like that. We can't do that kind of age measuring. But we can do relative age measuring by saying there, uh, there's like a crater in here. It's very, very old. It's so old it's been covered up again. And then there's been newer uh, impacts that have happened over top of this. So this is three ages old. There was the age when it happened, there's the age when it got covered up, and then the age when it got, that area got hit again with subsequent uh, craters. The problem in crater counts comes in when you have something like this basin here, Rustavelli, and the m majority of these craters out here are ejecta craters, not uh, individual impacts from something in space. So uh, we had an army of grad students as well as uh, a number of PhD planetary scientists who this was what they studied was crater counts and trying to ferret out, well, is that a, an actual impact crater or is that an ejecta impact? And this went on for, uh, it's still going on for a lot of it. Um, this crater here is, Apollo, uh, is uh, Apollodorus. Uh, it's right near the center. The center of the Caloris Basin is right about here. And this is a uh, serendipitous subsequent impact on the Caloris Basin right near the center. And there's these fossae that radiate away from the center of the uh, uh, Caloris Basin. Um, they're called the Pantheon fossae. And this impact basin coincides right on top of them. And it appears as if it were to have created these, uh, these cracks, but, but actually did not. They, they, these cracks all happened after the Chloris Basin filled in with uh, the liquid lava, and then it cooled and started contracting and, and fracturing. Elsewhere in the plains, we can see what we call ghost craters. These, these craters right here, there's one over here, there's uh, some right here and here. These are old craters that happened long time ago. And then the area was subsequently overrun with a lava plain, which then settled out and solidified. And you could just see the rims of these craters. And then again, later in time, more recently, these other impacts then happened. This is the Enterprise Rupees. It goes off the uh, page here, cuts through this crater, and cuts through this large basin, and goes on the other side. It's the largest uh, scarp system in, uh, on, on the planet. It's uh, about a thousand kilometers long and it's upwards of three kilometers high. This is the Carnegie Roofs. It's a, a perspective shot, just uh, showing you uh, the, red, the redder the image, the higher in elevation, the bluer, the lower in elevation. And green would be what we arbitrarily determined would be the mercury mean surface or, or, or sea level, if you will. This is a false color image of uh, the Durain crater. This is the crater here, Durain. And this purple blue stuff is that low reflectance material I mentioned that we saw, uh, that we found earlier. And we see it in all kinds of areas. Most of the time we see this, it's associated with a crater. So this is either uh, impact melt or it's subsurface material that was excavated up, thrown up, and then settled out out here. This is a, a false color image uh, showing the laser topography uh, of the northern hemisphere. Again, the redder to whiter, the higher it is, the uh, bluer, the lower it is. And from our measurements, uh, from the highest to the lowest points on Mercury that we were able to measure, it's about 10 kilometers uh, difference. This is an edge of a uh, volcanic caldera. The, the fluting here, uh, these, these uh, gullies were created by landslides down into this area here. 
The, the bottom of the volcanic caldera has been filled in and has had subsequent impacts over time. This is a false color image of the Caloris Basin. Uh, the, the, the false color imagery uh, el helps us to try and identify the difference in the chemical, the mineralogical, and the geo uh, morphological uh, composition of the surface of the planet. So where you see these orange spots here, 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 and here, and some down here, and some over here, these are volcanic caldera. The, uh, the basin area is made of, of, of uh, you know, lava from that's, that's long since solidified, and uh, then you got this other material out here that's not the same material as inside. And if you look at then at these craters here, this crater Ache, this is uh, Munch, Sander, and Poe, these three craters here, they have dark uh, material associated with them. It's, it's actually, it's the low reflectance material associated with them, except for Sanders in the middle, which has some very, very bright uh, bright material, which is these hollows that uh, you were asking about. This is a uh, gamma ray uh, uh, survey map uh, of, of the potassium distribution on uh, Mercury. And it's very strong potassium uh, detections in this area of the planet. We don't know why. There, it does not seem to correspond to anything specific because uh, um, Chloris is, I, uh, if I remember, it's right over here. It's, it's over here. It's, it's off. 60 degrees from this view. Uh, I mentioned the exosphere earlier. One of the things we, we did do was study the exosphere and we studied it intently when we couldn't look at the planet surface. And we know that from Earth observations that, Mar uh, that Mercury has a uh, sodium tail. Uh, it's seasonal depending on when Mercury's closer or further from the sun, but we can detect a tail of sodium streaming off of the planet. And this yellow here is the, the sodium detection. So it seems to pop up on the sunlit side and then swing around and drift out and off the planet surface. Another thing we were studying was the calcium that's in, this, the, uh, in the, in the uh, exosphere. And we discovered that really the calcium is concentrated on the morning side of the planet. So this is north looking down. So this is the evening here. And then this is the morning side. So as the sun is starting to heat up the early to mid-morning side of Mercury's surface, the calcium that's on there is, is photos, uh, disassociating off of the surface, streaming out into the exosphere, and then apparently gets sucked back in by the gravity and to be redeposited again to be boiled off later. Uh, I don't remember how far the distance was uh, that they had the calcium going out to. Uh, is the illustration to scale? Uh, this? No, it's just, uh, this is a combination of, uh, uh, of the observations that we've taken over uh, the four years. Just the, the intensity combination. Right. Okay, but, but the shape of the thing... Is the it shape about, is... Is it about a quarter of the diameter? Of yeah, the yeah. But I don't remember how far out we had the detections go. Uh, the sodium tail, I think, went out seven or ten mercury diameters. Um, this is a uh, image using the VIRS, uh, the visual infrared uh, surface composition uh, spectrometer, overlaid on the MDIS camera images of the surface of Mercury, and the color comes from VIRS to show you. Uh, what the uh, surface composition differences are across the planet. It's, it's, it's a fairly complex world. It's not as, as dull and benign as uh, you would think just looking at it. Look, it's a gray rock with a bunch of holes in it. It's, it's very complex, just teasing out how the, 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 the carbon and the iron and the titanium and the potassium all are intertwined in here is, is an ongoing uh, task. Uh, I know some people in here went on the geology hike this morning and were saying that when Lyle was talking about, we got, you know, we're in this bedding plane, we're doing this bedding plane, we've just crossed over to this bedding plane. Some people are saying, wow, this is really complicated. This is complicated. This makes my head hurt. And I don't even get to play with this. 
the, we have an X-ray uh, spectrometer also on the, the space, had an X-ray spectrometer on the spacecraft. I have to speak in past tense since it doesn't exist anymore. Um, this is a uh, magnesium silicon and aluminum silicon ratio map. Uh, magnesium silicon is, is in this one and then aluminum silicon is over here. The chlorous basin in both cases is right here. So the chlorous basin is actually very, has a very low magnesium silicon ratio compared to the uh, aluminum silicon that's in that area. We were also doing gravity studies of the planet, trying to find out where the gravity anomalies are. And the chlorous basin is right here. There's another uh, uh, impact basin over here called sub -O, uh, sub -O -O. Uh, It's It's much smaller, but the redder an area is on this image, the uh, m heavier, or uh, more dense the gravity anomaly is in these, these spots. Did they move at all? No. So this is, a, uh, a f again, another false color image. There's Caloris Basin here. And you can see these, the white areas here are the, the ejecta uh, rays from a number of the younger uh, impact basins. And this is a natural color image of what Mercury looks like. There is, there is hints of blue. Caloris Basin is actually a, a tannish brown. Much of this is a, a tannish gray. How many of you guys here... Uh, watched the Big Bang Theory. A few of you. How many of you have noticed the image on the refrigerator of Leonard and Sheldon's apartment? In the beginning, it was a Hubble image. About two thirds of the way through the fourth season, it was this image. The, the Big Bang folks called us up and they, they talked to our mission operation manager and said, tell us about your day and can we use some of your images? And he told us about the interview. He sent them some images. And they said, okay, well, look for this episode. You'll see some images. So he told us, and at that point, I hadn't actually watched The Big Bang Theory any. And so I turned it on. I watched The, the Big Bang Theory, and that was on the refrigerator. Supposedly, there's two other images still in the apartment that I haven't been able to find them. Anyway, the hollows. The hollows are these strange, odd features, principally found in base, in, in, on the floors of craters on Mercury. But they can be found on the peaks. They can be found on the walls. They can be found on the rims. But principally, they're in here. And when you look at them, uh, in the images, they will appear to be very, very bright compared to much of Mercury. And what it seems to be is like this is a sublimation area where, th the, where the volatiles are just sublimating away and eroding out. There's a close-up of some hollows here. Kind of looks like Swiss cheese. Which way is the illumination from? From the upper left? Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, upper right, coming in this direction. Okay, so that's a depression. Right. Yes, this is a depression. So this is a false color image uh, accentuating uh, the hollows. Uh, the blue is, is, is the hollows features. And this is, what this primarily demonstrates is, is it's very geologically different than the surrounding terrain. And that's from the spectrum. Yeah, from the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the craters Munch, Sander, and Poe in the Chloris Basin earlier. This is Munch, this is Sanders, this is Poe. The dark blue here is the low reflectance material. The yellow is the Caloris Basin uh, lava plain, if you will. And the white here is the hollows that are in Sanders. And this thing is just full of hollows. There's a number of papers that have been published on as to what the different planetary geologists think they are or the mechanism that formed them. But there's still a lot of debate in, in the community as to all that. Um, some space oddities. A couple things here. The Chloris Basin, as you saw, was a fairly large impact basin relative to the size of Mercury. It, it's massive. So whatever hit it, 
you would expect there would be some catastrophic effects other than just making a basin. The biggest catastrophic effect was when the impact uh, happened, there were seismic waves that went all the way around the planet in all directions, and they met at the antipodal point of the Chloris Basin. And then this is the terrain at the antipodal point. It's full of these, uh, these very hilly, bumpy areas. And it's the only place on Mercury that's like this. It was seen by um, Mariner 10, because it was more in the sun than uh, Chloris Basin was, but we got much better resolution with uh, Messenger, and the technical term that the planetary scientists use for this area is called weird terrain. <laughs> Other things we've seen are these, like these, these uplift plateaus here. It kind of looks like a tooth, but when we did a higher resolution imaging of it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, the ices. So you guys remember this image here? Um, this is a higher resolution image of the Arecibo data that we had. And it looks like those are craters, but this is before Messenger got there and we could overlay uh, actual imagery onto these points. And it, they correspond precisely with craters. Now this is the uh, orbital path of Messenger on, at, at Mercury. It was in a polar orbit. So we were 86 uh, and a half degrees off of 90 degrees. So we got a lot of visual and laser topography and all kinds of data from the poles because that was one of our, you know, remember six uh, questions, what's going on with the poles, what's that bright stuff? So this is that perspective view. Now, one of the things we did, we had a neutron spectrometer on the spacecraft. So we were measuring what the neutron flux is on the planet. Where uh, you see white, you expect neutron flux to be at a fairly high level. Where you see blue, and the blue here is, a, this is a model, if we could focus the neutron spectrometer at the spots where we suspect that's, that's uh, water ice, that's what it would look like. Because the water ice would inhibit the neutron uh, from bubbling out. What we saw was this. So we have a hint that, well, we got the Arecibo data, it's very bright in the radar, it looks like water. The neutron spectrometer suggests that, well, since we have far fewer neutrons coming out of this region than we do the rest of the planet, maybe that's, you know, that's another uh, card that says this could be water. So with the medium speed neutron, if we have no ice, we would expect this kind of flux. This is a model. And if we have pure ice, pure water ice up there, we would expect this kind of fall off. And this is the latitude going from 30 degrees to 90 degrees. And that's the relative flux. What we saw was that in the data. Matched up pretty close. Even, you know, with these error bars, we, we pretty close. The high speed neutrons, again, the no ice, you expect this, with surface ice, ice right on the surface of Pluto, or, uh, of, of uh, Mercury, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm self-conflicted myself. Um, this is what you would expect the fall off to be. What we saw was that. Interesting. It starts to go off, but then not quite. So what does that mean? You're assuming that fall off because ice extends to some minimum latitude uniformly? Yeah. If, if you had ice on the surface here, then you would expect this kind of a fall off. You have ice on the surface. Uniform layer over the entire area of ice? Mm hmm No, no, for, well, it, it, you'd have to take a, a broad view. Remember, the neutron spectrometer sees a broad area, right. not a, a focus spot. But the model must have assumed some extent of the ice and then a stop. Or was it assuming I don't know. I wasn't modeling it. I was involved in mission operations and the mass stuff. Yeah. So... To answer how that might be is you have a cosmic rays come in, they liberate some neutrons from some subsurface sub molecules. The neutrons then spit out, and that's what we detect with the neutron spectrometer. If you have a layer of ice here, that will absorb that. If you have, you know, a thicker layer will absorb more. If you put 
a blanket of material over it, you'll actually get some stuff bubbling off of that too. So this is a, a, a time-lapse movie looking down at the pole and you can see like in this crater right here, that area right there and that whole crater, never see the sun. What's the actual tilt of Mercury? So anyone? Uh, you're close. 0 0.01 degrees. A hundredth of a degree. So I'll play the movie again. You know, the pole is right there. And so every place you see where there's a crater and the sun doesn't shine, it's a phrase, that's where we saw these bright radar returns. Now play. There we go. So the big crater's right here. The other crater's right here. And there's a crater there, a couple craters here that had no, you know, no, no sun in, this, in the subsurface area. It's going to play again. <laughs> mm-hmm. So these are the bright radar returns from Arecibo, and these are the also the permanently shadowed regions on Mercury. So these are the, uh, the, uh, the craters, Tolkien, Candestiny, Prokofiev is the big one here. Again, this is a, a laser topography uh, image. The bluer, the deeper, the greener is Mercury mean, yellow or red is, is, is higher terrain. Another thing we were doing with the laser altimeter is measuring the amount of energy that we would get back from the laser signal. So we beam the, signal, we beam the laser down and we get a return and we measure how much a return that was. That would tell us what kind of absorption the surface would have of the laser. So these darker areas here, we had a lower return than what we would normally expect. The white areas are normal return from what we expect. The red spots here are actually areas where we got a brighter return than what we would expect. And you notice most of them fall right in where the craters are. Measuring the uh, temperature of the, uh, of, of the craters here, you can see they get down to you know, 70, 50 Kelvin, which is a little bit chilly, a little colder than it was last night. <laughs> um, and water ice can exist stably in the open at that temperature. So how does all this come about? How do we get water ice there on a, a body that's you know, three, three tenths of an astronomical unit away from this plasma ball? It's, it doesn't all melt off because, again, we got the axial tilt being 0 0.01. So we have this permanently shadowed area here. The temperature ranges from 350K to 80K. A dirty snowball, comet comes in, impacts. The, the impact is distributed about. It's, it's a dirty snowball, so there's impurities in it, in this is ice ball. So that's represented by the black dots. The shadow area uh, shows you where the sun has sublimated stuff away. As the sublimation uh, calms down, the top layer gets covered with the remnants of the material that was present before the sublimation, trapping the ice underneath. But this part of the ice here was never bothered by the sun, so it stays exposed to space. And these are the areas where the laser altimeter was getting higher than reading uh, normal returns. So now we have the Arecibo radar data, we have the X-ray spectrometer, we have the uh, MDIS camera visual, we can see the, the craters, and we have the laser altimeter. All these things point to there being water ice there. The, and the neutron spectrometer, right, sorry. Um, so what, so now that we've basically confirmed there's water ice on Mercury, we want to see it. 
and the, the camera wasn't really designed for that sort of thing, but we have Photoshop. <laughs> and we could stretch the hell out of the images. And this is the, the floor of this crater. And it's covered with material, but that's where the water ice is hiding, right there. In the southern hemisphere, the same thing. There's, there's uh, craters there that have permanently shadowed areas and have bright radar returns. However, due to the highly elliptical orbit that we had, we have no good follow-up uh, data down here. For the North Pole, we were 200 kilometers over the surface at our periaps. For the South Pole, 10,000 kilometers. A little bit different. Couldn't get the same resolution. The laser altimeter only went to 1,200 kilometers in, in range. So we couldn't even use laser altimeter here, really. So that part of the, the program for the science and, and the accomplishments of Mercury, of, of Messenger, Mercury, uh, covered the last days of Messenger. Is there, is there, any the um, there have been people who've done it, but I don't, I don't know what, the, what they have. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, actually. I know they've talked about it, but I don't know if what the, they have come up with. I, I'll have, I know the guy who's working on it. I'll have to ask him. So while we're in orbit, um, the, the orbit that Messenger had around Mercury, is, is w it was unstable. It was highly elliptical, and we had the, the tug of Mercury's gravity that wanted to pull us down. We had the tug of the sun that wanted to pull us away, and we were also getting buffeted by the solar wind because we're that much closer, the solar wind is that much more intense. So the, the orbit, if, if you imagine this is uh, the planet, the orbit was going to either shift this way or shift this way. And eventually we were going to, the orbit was going to intersect with the surface of the planet. That would be bad because we don't have landing gears. So what we had were orbital correction maneuvers, OCMs, planned through the life of the mission. And the mission was designed to go for a year, but we had plenty of uh, fuel on board to keep boosting the orbit up to keep it going. And we ended up getting extensions from NASA to go a little more than four years. Um, we went to orbit in 2011. So, um, this is the uh, end of 2014, 2015 here, we were going to impact at the end of March. If we did nothing else but the orbital correction maneuvers, as you see here, this is the descending altitude. We would get down to, you know, 45, 43 uh, kilometers over the surface. Uh, the H's here are the hot seasons when, uh, Mer uh, when Messenger would pass directly in front of the bright, uh, mercury surface and we would have heating issues and we'd have to take mitigating steps so that the instruments wouldn't be damaged and mostly that just meant we shut down we didn't do anything with them for that period of time which was on the order of 20 minutes to an hour and then we'd let them cool off and then we could work with them again so we went through he hot seasons uh, and then cool seasons in between and each orbital correction move we would boost our altitude up and would come back down boost it up and come back down boost up and then we would eventually go crashing down. The same guy that came up with the whole solar sailing thing said, you know, we're running out of hydrazine. Hydrazine is the volatile component of the fuel that we use to, pow to, to boost the spacecraft up, that we use in the rocket. To push the hydrazine through the, uh, the lines, we use cold helium. He said, you know, we got all this cold helium, we're, we're not using it. What if we use that instead? We're going to run out of hydrazine here soon. We have cold helium, so they sat down, they did the math, they said, we can do this. We can use cold helium, something that's never been done before, to keep the spacecraft alive. So cold helium has a, a it's, it's denser than the hydrazine, so you get a less, less of a throw weight with it, so you can't get as much of an oomph out of it as you do with the hydrazine. But we got enough that we figured we could get another month out of Messenger. A month is, you know, anything we get is, is, is gravy for us, is icing, because that means we'll we're going to have a very low periaps. We're going to get a lot more data at a lower altitude, although we'll be going faster, uh, but stuff that we hadn't even planned on getting from the mission. So this is the new uh, 
orbital correction maneuvers here that we would do. These are the ones that I showed you before, and then these were the ones with the cold gas here. We just keep bumping it up, bumping it up, bumping it up until eventually we landed really hard. <laughs> so uh, originally uh, the Mercury impact was going to be here, and um, we actually got around to this point here. If it had been just a few days later, we would have actually seen the signal go in and then stop. As it was due to the orientation, we saw the signal go right behind the planet and then stop within minutes of it actually impacting. So that was the, the spike we landed at four kilometers a second. Yes, yes, that's a, you know, it's what we call litho braking. <laughs> With both spellings of braking. There is a follow on mission uh, coming by ESA and JAXA, the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency called Bepi Colombo. They, if they launch, they're waiting for one instrument, uh, they should get there in the early 2020s back to Mercury. They're going to be looking for the messenger crater. And the, they are very, very interested, and we're very interested in understanding what they see because this will be the most recent excavation of subsurface material on Mercury that we know. We know exactly when it happened. So we can tell, you know, it hasn't been uh, space weathered to death or anything. We'll be able to have very, very fresh material to see. So that was the impact point here. Sad, you can do your eulogies. You know, we have the coordinates right there. This was the very first image we took with Messenger of Mercury. And this is the very last image we got from Messenger of Mercury. And I guess I should stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where's the movie? Oh, it's... I don't have sound here, huh? Yeah, we have sound? Real quick? Oh, perfect. All right. You'll see me in the corner of this periodically. Not, not there. Well, there should be sound. No sound? Well, there's, there's, some, there's some gas. Uh, this is Sean Solomon. Uh, he was the guy who envisioned uh, the messenger mission and, and uh, was the person who led us all the way through you know, the, the proposal series to the end of mission time. Pardon? What time frame was that? Around late 1990s, early 2000s. Nope, no sound. Uh, All right, we'll do this. Were you in the no, that was the output. It was the output. Maybe you guys can hear this. operations 
cooks and instrument people and uh, managers who have worked uh, tirelessly and, uh, and uh, for long, long hours, many weeks out of the year, to make this incredible mission uh, happen. It's been a fantastic achievement. Uh, we go down in the history books for science and for space exploration. You guys are all part of it. Thank you for giving us Thank you very much. And with that, I finished the talk. We have, uh, we have some time for questions. Yep, I got some questions first. Oh, well, yeah, I got seven more posters to give away. Uh, so I'm asking my questions first. Um, what's the axial tilt of Mercury? Uh, you got to raise your hand. There you go. What's the axial tilt of Jupiter? He's closer. Three point one. But what is the orbital inclination of Mercury? I don't see any hands. I hear numbers, but I don't see any hands. The, or, the orbital inclination of, of Mercury? Uh, the, the whole orbit. Not Matt Messenger. No. It's close. Yes, seven. seven. On the opposite side of the planet from Caloris, what is that terrain called? Weird terrain, but yeah, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> um, what was the one geologic feature that we discovered that we had no name for because we'd never seen it before on any other planet? Hollows. Hollows. I got two more left. What was the first mission to go to Pluto? New Horizons. <laughs> now, to see who guys who was paying attention here, I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, one more question for you guys. All right, this is an easy one. What was the material or what was the component we used to keep Messenger going for another month? Cold helium. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> another name for. No worries, it's all good. All right, yes. Question, uh, so you mentioned the, uh, obviously Mercury does have an atmosphere. Uh, did we know that uh, before we got there with uh, Messenger or was there a discovery? No, Mariner 10 discovered it. Okay. Uh, that was one of the surprising discoveries Mariner 10 had was like there's an exosphere here. So we knew, we, we had that forewarning and we were able to then study it from Earth using telescopes, okay. uh, you know, spectroscopes, uh, spectrographs on telescopes. And so we could detect the sodium on there, but we didn't know what else was in it, uh, what it was composed of. With Messenger, since we knew it was there, we had an instrument designed to study it specifically. So we were able to, to pick out the calcium. We picked out magnesium. And I think we picked out uh, potassium uh, and some other, uh, I don't remember what else we picked out of it. Okay. Yeah? Do they have an idea what the dark material is and what they have formed it? Actually, we're working on that. Um, we, uh, 
think it might have something to do with carbon darkening, um, but we don't fully know yet. Uh, different, the different science teams from the different instruments ha have been studying this, and I've been trying to help out a little bit with what I can with the mass team to study this. So I've been doing a lot of the data uh, reduction analysis and ferreting out the stuff that doesn't work very well from the, from the data with the stuff that actually works really well so we can take that and to compare it to what the other teams are finding. Yeah. Uh, the Bepi Colombo is going underway right now. Um, they're they're actually they should have launched or should be launching this year, except for the, a delay with one of the instruments for that mission. Bepi Colombo is actually going to be two spacecraft joined together as it goes out, and when it gets to orbit, they're going to break apart and have two orbiters, uh, one run by ESA, one run by JAXA. Uh, now I don't think they're going to be stereoing, but they, they you could do stereo. We did stereo imaging with uh, Messenger. Uh, where we would pass over the planet and, and look at the the MDIS camera could had a, a gimbal so it could uh, angle a little bit we could look at one degree ang at one angle and then another pass look at the other angle so we could get the stereo imaging that way but for the most part what we did was was uh, surface mapping with the camera. Yeah, um, when you mentioned the end of core, the, I assume that means liquid core. Yes. Is there a reason to believe there has been a rotation of the crust? Because you said the impacts were on the southern hemisphere. Do we know that was the southern hemisphere? Yes, because we've seen it on other uh, bodies in the solar system where the southern hemisphere is more heavily uh, cratered than the northern hemisphere. Does that imply the magnetic field was somehow locked to the surface? No, because if it was locked to the surface, you would just get a, a, a surface, a crustal uh, a, a magnetic field like we have on, on right. Mars. I don't know. Um, you know, what would keep the crust, obviously there's not crustal dynamics as an earth, why hasn't the entire crust floated around? I don't know. Is that it? Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I bet I know it's wrong with your audio. Probably the audio is being sent out the HDMI. Mm -hmm. So if we.